My name is uh, Anthony Milton. I'm a uh, Kitchen Nation from Hazleton, BC. And that's where I live till I was about, possibly about five years old. I was apprehended by an Indian agent that apprehends children for the residential schools. And that was the last time I saw my hometown. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. During the time in the residential school, uh, I just remember a classroom just at one time and the teacher looked me in the face and said uh, something. I, I didn't understand her. I responded with my language. And then uh, right away I had a big slap on the face, dragged me out of the classroom, handed me over to a supervisor and that's where tragedy started in my life. Many were inadequately fed, clothed, and housed. All were deprived of the care and nurturing of their parents, grandparents, and communities. Growing up in Surrey, so my father was Scottish and my mother was native, I wasn't introduced to anything culturally because I'm, I'm pretty sure my mom was running away from it. My mom is a residential school survivor. My mom is a my mom is uh, was uh, deaf, so she went to the um, Jericho Hill School of Deaf, which was just as horrible as any residential school. And my mom didn't want to talk about it. They, that's the problem with the people that are that are from residential school. They don't talk about it. So I was never brought around. There was never anything like that brought around because I don't think my mom embraced it because she was from a very 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 young age. My mom was taught that it was wrong. My mom was taken to residential school when she was five years old. She didn't get, she didn't leave the system until she was 17 when she graduated. And I honestly think she just did not want to go back. She didn't want us to see the, that. I, it's, yeah, I just think she did not want us to live this life that she thought that they gave her. And it's, it's sad and I realize now that you know, my mom was just there trying to protect us. The psychological and the physical effect that this whole process has had on me stems back to my childhood and ending up in residential school. That was the beginning. Prior to that, I remember growing up, being in a loving home, even though I was raised by my grandparents. My whole family is very, very tight. And after I ended up in residential school, that whole dynamic changed for me. I had nothing but hatred for everybody. It didn't matter whether it was my fa family, it was, you know, I saw everybody as a predator. I believed that everybody was out to hurt me no matter what. I spent the next 25 years of my life going through some of the roughest things that you people could probably never even imagine that existed inside the institutions. I've been there and I've gone through that. I've been locked up for years on end. I've gone through the kinds of things that, you know, a human being should never have to go through. I've been in just about every federal institution right across Canada, right to the shoe. The most uh, violent environment. 
and I still have not found one institution that is comparable to what I've experienced in residential school. In residential school, it was very personal. My life growing up, I've been to a lot of foster homes, residential schools, um, and I entered into the young offender system at the age of 12. In foster homes and residential schools, I was abused, physically abused, sexually abused from uh, you know, the people that worked there. Um, so I carried a lot around, a lot of anger towards towards anybody. I didn't trust anybody. I was, you know, I, I entered into the young offender system at an early age, age of 12, and. From there, it was just a total, I had no, absolutely no role models, nobody I can reach out to because I didn't trust anybody. I went on from young offender system right to a maximum security prison. As far as the incarceration rates, we're still dealing with prejudice and, and, and poverty plays a huge role as well. You know, um, survival crime, you know, like a survival sex trade. I call it a lot of the youth that I've worked with survival drug trade. Um, just surviving, you know, it, and uh, has creates that. But it's also, you know, all those prejudices we deal with. A lot of our people can't afford lawyers or, or, or good lawyers. A lot of them don't understand their rights as well. Today, we're we're seeing a lot of our indigenous um, children being in the uh, caught up in the system. They've been they're, they're again they're being taken away. I think today there's there's um, there's more kids in the foster care system than there was at the height of the residential school era. I really worry about what's going to happen when they become adults. What choices are they going to be making? Right. So it's almost like we need to change the tide because I don't want to be sitting here in 20 years saying that 60% of the population inside is indigenous because I think that's where we're headed if we don't make, if we don't make any, any these changes. Circle of Eagles Lodge of course starts way back in 1968. I was uh, invited by the, um, what was called the uh, Indian Education Club in the BC Penitentiary in, in those days to come and uh, speak to them about some of the plans they had and wanted to have, wanted some support from the outside. So, so I actually I started visiting the, the guys inside in around 1968 and just learned about what, they, what their dreams was. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, their uh, main concern was uh, having a safe place to go to when they're released back into the community. So in 1970, we got the grant from the First Citizen Fund to purchase a house. And, and um, so uh, we looked around and, and found the house on, on uh, 12th and uh, Clark. And so and we opened the house with, I think, three of our brothers that were released to the community and then eventually grew to 12 <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> Yeah. We recently renamed our lodge to the name of the founder of Circle of Eagles, which is March White's traditional name. So Nana Hemyes is now what we call the Brothers Lodge, and she's been instrumental in not only with this, she has worked with the Friendship Centers across BC. She's been involved in so many things. There's a power behind that woman that is beyond words. And what she's done for Circle of Eagles is amazing. Over the last 50 years, we've just seen that continue and grow and grow to the point that we are now not just have a house for the brothers, we have a house for the sisters. We have a sweat lodge in inner city Vancouver, which we were the first to have that available to have people not only that we work with, but the community come in. And community is a big part of what we do. We're not isolated to just working with the small group of people that we work with. 
we're, we're also part of the community. We want the community to be part. We want the, the best way for integration is to be part of a community, to be part of a culture, to learn about their healing and their background. So that's really where it goes for me, is about being part of. One of the main foundations of Circle of Eagles Lodge is that we treat the brothers with respect. We treat, all of us treat each other with respect. And we expect that throughout all our organization, from the board, the staff, and those that we serve. And we demonstrate that daily. We consistently change our programs to adapt to our needs of the, the population and the brothers that we serve and the sisters that we serve. We, we, we adapt our programs. The main way that we develop and implement these programs is that we need to have buy-in from the brothers. Is there, and one way we do that is we involve them in some of the work that we're doing. Like for example, at the board level, we have a seat that is dedicated, that is held by a brother. At board meetings, for example, he'll come up with real life examples, real examples of what um, are some of the issues. So it's very, it's very important to have their voice at all levels of the decision making. Circle of the Eagles Lodge Society, they embrace a holistic approach which services the needs in the areas of housing, employment, addictions, culture, mental health. A lot of the men and women that come out from the prison system don't have you know, plans for employment, they lack connections to culture, they lack connections to family and community. I think Circle of Eagles Lodge Society really fills those gaps for those individuals that come out maybe feeling lost or alone or disconnected. Something that I've noticed about Circle of Eagles Lodge Society and specifically at Nanahamas and Anderson Lodge is that they don't only provide a safe place for the offenders to reside, but they really create a home environment. Um, what I mean by this is they create experiences like celebrating Easter, having pumpkin carving at Halloween, they celebrate Christmas, they do little things that a lot of us I think take for granted, but these individuals coming to these um, residential facilities, they never had these experiences as children, and I think that's what creates a sense of belonging and connectedness for a lot of these individuals. Before you go to jail, you're you have to do a pre-sentence report, you do like the glitty report, you do all these things before you go to jail. They, like, it's almost like you get prepared somewhat, but once you're done, it's just like there's the door and you're pushed and that's it. And it's a weird, it's, it's not that it's, it's, it's weird that you're so controlled for so long and then just once it ends, there's a lost feeling and it's it's odd and I don't think I would feel that feeling because I, I had everything in order I have my own place I have a job and all this stuff but I'm going through these emotions of this post sentence it's it's like this traumatic event just happened and now I'm dealing with this this trauma and this trauma was this this ordeal in my life which was in, in essence was about nine years of my life I've had so much support with circle that it's, I don't think I could have done it without it. If I went to a different halfway house, I don't think I would have gotten the same situation. For, honestly, if I was in a different halfway house, I think I would have breached and probably went back in. Because I would have probably, you know, fell off and got drunk or something, but I didn't because I had all the cultural support there. And that kind of, like, when I did have those moments, I could talk to someone. And then there was something, okay, and then you just talk through it. And then that urge to go out, the urge to get drunk or the urge to get high, kind of just goes away. You know, having that support is, is tremendous for me. Being a kid, going into an adult system and, you know, they have their programs and all that kind of stuff and I just, you know, I didn't really focus on myself because I was, I was always just the kid in the group. So it, was, it wasn't like I can just speak up and talk about whatever. So I didn't deal with those issues and when I got out, I transferred to Vancouver, BC to Circle of Eagles. Circle of Eagles has always been there for me ever since I was, I was young, I was like 24 years old. They've always been there for me. I've seen the change of staff, but you know, the place has been always, it was, it's always been good to me. Even till this day, I'm out living by myself, but you know, I still 
go to circle, I still try to go to the sweats and stuff like that, and you know, and I'm always gonna have a connection. One of the things that we're looking at right now in the current climate that we have is harm reduction within the population that we're working with. We look at the brothers and the sisters that are coming out of the institutions and the whole poisoning that's happening, particularly on the downtown east side where, where we are. There's all these places where we look at what does harm reduction look like for all of us. Last year we had our second annual harm reduction program that we put together and in that we had all different people. We had Corrections Canada, we had Health Services, we had um, First Nations Health Authority, we had people, brothers from the houses, we had everybody gathered together to see what that means and we came up with some really strong moving forward kind of ideas of how we're going to tackle this. But it's a process and it's long and we don't want to lose any more lives in the meantime. So looking at each person as an individual and how we can work with them is a big part of, of how we need, to, we need to focus on moving forward with Circle of Eagles. One of the programs we started last year was peer support. We have now two peer support workers that work and one of the good things that happens is the brothers will go to them and they'll talk to them and they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm either using, I'm thinking of using and the peer support will work with them to have them either come to other staff members, go to their parole officer, be able to find ways to not to prevent it from happening. So we've had a couple of, of really positive outcomes with the peer support workers and we're hoping to be able to continue that and grow that program so that there's trust that, that happens within the lived experience that we found is really successful. You know, we can't just put somebody in this box and leave them there. We have to have a way for them to get out and to learn and to grow. So now I always look at somebody and not where they were, but where they are and where they want to get to. And I try to help them on that path, you know, help them get to where they want to be. And that's what Circle's done for me, is just to them see me not as a police officer, but as a member of the community and a human being and having that trust in me. Yeah. The rate in Vancouver, very, very low for tenancy. We then have the added piece to that where you now have a criminal record. You don't have a stable job. You don't have all the things you need to be able to get a place. So there's that piece of it that makes it even more difficult to come into Vancouver. And while Vancouver does have more jobs in general, a lot of these guys are getting their tickets for construction, um, landscaping, they come out with great opportunity when they're coming out here, they're just not able to become part of the community in finding housing that is stable for them. When you're growing up as a child and, and if you went to residential school, you were denied the privilege and, and the right to practice your, your culture and to know your culture and even to speak your language and so, so it, it it's always been a challenge, or it was a real challenge for, for us to just recognize that that was a very important uh, component in, in the uh, way of, of helping our brothers and sisters to heal and to really look at the issues that, that, that uh, may have uh, forced them to get into criminal activities and so my thought is uh, this practice has been most helpful and and just witnessing what, what the circle has done with uh, their involvement with uh, Camp Potlatch uh, and just spending that time and really uh, really practicing some of the cultures and, and that and and I'm grateful for the uh, uh, Correctional Services Canada that they have allowed the brothers from inside to participate in, in Camp Potlatch because I, I believe that it helps to really uh, get a feel of uh, practicing that on the outside and, and how important it is for, you know, for them to have that in their, in their lives. So. so this trip for many people is their first time out of the city, out of that concrete jungle, out of that noise that we hear constantly, and coming out here, the amount of stories that come out, 
It starts out that people don't really know each other at the beginning. By the end of this journey, everybody has formed a different bond. For some people, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. It's about recognizing where their past is, where they want to go. It's the ceremonies that take place here with the sweat lodge, with the canoe journeys, taking them out with the circles, uh, working with the elders, working with what's really going on. We have uh, um, elders that work with the brothers and um, we've seen a lot of them make positive changes in their lives. Uh, it's not a, it's not a overall fix, but it's a taste of um, what life could be for them in terms of their healing and, and uh, making positive changes in their lives. We ask them to identify themselves, where they're from. A majority of the people over the years would say, I'm from Vancouver. And we can tell by looking at them from the plains, from the north, from the interior, from the coast, we can tell. So they have lost touch with their cultural backgrounds. And it's very important uh, for the people to get connected to the culture. And uh, when we open the part participants up, we open them up, we open up that raw, traumatic issues that they, they've never dealt with or talked with in their lives, we open them up. And then uh, not too soon after that, we'll have a ceremony where me and the other facilitator will come in and we'll brush them off, help them close that wound up for a while. I met a warden that was the first warden female of Saskatchewan Penitentiary that I connected with and I worked with very well and she was a very decent uh, woman that actually went out of her way to talk to an elder to work with me personally. And that was the first time I've had an opportunity to actually go to a sweat lodge. And then I started to connect with the elders back then in the later part of the 1990s. And over the course of the next 10 years or so that I worked with an elder, I learned to understand who I am as a person. And I learned to have respect for myself because what I needed to do was go back into my childhood and spirituality and my culture is what allowed me to go back into that. I've gone through all kinds of programs inside the institution. Like I said, going to RPC, doing all their programs, all these uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and a lot of different things. All of that was educational, but it didn't allow me to reconnect with my childhood the way that the elder has allowed me to do that. When I started doing my fasting and I started to connect and I started to feel and I started to recognize how significant the abuse was in that residential school. I had to face that. I had to put it one-on-one. -on -one. I had to take each and every event that was significant as a kid, me growing up, in order for me to overcome that. Even today, sometimes it's very difficult for me to talk about some of these things because I've seen my best friend hung himself. I was nine years old when I seen that. You know, that's one of the things that stuck with me the most until I was about 35 years old. I actually had to do a ceremony with an elder to let that go. All these years, I never realized how much this, uh, this, this one incident affected me. And it wasn't until I actually went into a ceremony, made my offerings and actually spoke to him inside the sweat lodge 
that the burden became to be less than what it usually was when I thought about it because prior to that when I think about it I always got really angry and I started to hate. I didn't know who I hated. I didn't know who I was angry at but I, I was a person that I didn't like. And then when I got connected with the uh, cultural ceremonies that was the beginning of me starting to understand who I was. And I was in my 40s by the time I was okay with this person. By then I had already picked up a life sentence, but I didn't give up because I believed in who I was. And then I recognized who I was as a person. And then I started to respect myself. With that respect, I started to respect other people. Culture was one of the things that became very significant in my life. Working with the elders, doing ceremonies, going to sweats. This is the foundation of the person that I'm becoming today. And that's where Circle of Eagles is very significant to my cultural, to my spiritual growth. And I do believe that, you know, there, every province should have a Circle of Eagles facility right across Canada to address and help with, you know, working with the Aboriginal people. I've had brothers telling me, there was one he hadn't been in around the smudge or any ceremonies for a long time, and then he heard them yell out. What we do is one of the brothers will yell out smudge so everybody on the unit hears it. And he said something made him get, get up out of his bunk. He was feeling suicidal and he'd, he'd been in for about a month. And he said he just couldn't get out of his bunk, wasn't eating but something made him get up and go down and smudge. And he told me after that, he said like all of his heaviness was lifted. It was probably two years after that, I was at an Alcoholics Anonymous gathering and I didn't even recognize him. He was all on fire. He had gone to treatment and he ended up at Salton Lalem, turned his whole life around. So when he hugged me, he said, without that one smudge, I wouldn't be here today. So that, that's what keeps me going to hear those stories. I was given my smudge kit probably about two or three weeks into my, when I got to Iraq. And if it wasn't for that, I don't know, like it, I, when I was taught how to smudge, it, you were allowed to bring the smudge kit into your cells. So I would wake up, go to bed and smudge. And it was very grounding for me. And that helped. Like when you're stuck in a cell for 23 hours, all you do is think, think, think. And, you get, your mind goes, just goes crazy. And having something to ground you, uh, smudging, was, was therapeutic and it was a relief. And, you know, and I'm very thankful and I still have that smudge kit to this day. And I, just, I cherish it. I started getting into the culture and you know, through culture I humbled myself and I was able to learn more, right? I was able to learn uh, you know, how, how to be more responsible and how to communicate without getting mad. And, you know, man, how to be a better person, how to be a better father. And uh, uh, there was a, an elder who helped me a lot in uh, Matsque. His name was Gord Locke, really good man. He was a good guy and you know what I mean? He, he kept me grounded a lot, right? When I needed, you know, when I was, you know, always wanting, like, there was a few times when I was, you know, on the verge of just going back to everything and saying, fuck it, I don't need this, right? But I mean, I didn't because of him, man. And, and you know, because of him, I, I was able to, um, you know, I, I was able to get my day parole on my day parole eligibility date on my fifth federal sentence, man. So what does that say, man? Like, you know, they after your two or your two or three year, they write you off and you don't do anything. But you know, I got it, man, and I, and I you know, I changed my ways, man. I, I worked for it, man. I, I I started going to school. I got I got some of my um, the the adult basic education stuff that you know, like that stuff that I deprived myself of when I was a kid. I didn't go to school. I ran away. So I started doing that, I, I started doing my programs. Uh, I just started being responsible for myself, right? And I needed to change it, so, you know what I mean? And that's what happened. Wonderful people like Joe Fazella and my elders who nurtured me, showed me to remain on the red road and brought hope into a very dark environment and I maintained that all through my incarceration. And now that I'm out on full parole, I continue 
to attend uh, the shearing circles. I do all the programs. I lived on the Aboriginal uh, uh, range. I went through pathways. I attend the Warriors Against Violence. And um, um, my elders at uh, Anderson Lodge are my mentors. And if it wasn't for them, after spending 15 years in, it would be hard for me to become normal and a productive member of society again. But with my elders, I can do it. My culture has helped me. It's kept me sober. It's kept me clean. I've been clean and sober for about 10, 10 years, 11 years. I've been sober and clean for. I'm on full parole. Uh, working, you know, I'm employed full time the last almost two years since I've been out. And, keep, and it, uh, the culture keeps you grounded as a person, keeps you, you know, humble, respectful. But the individual has to want that because. How hard does that person want, want to change, right? And, and it boils down to how committed are you to following this way. It's, it's not an easy way to follow the red road. It, it, it's hard. It's hard to do. I grew up in a family where there wasn't a lot of structure, like apart uh, from my parents. My father was an alcoholic and my mother worked. Um, we grew up essentially just surviving and not knowing any of the culture and I was at a point in my life where it was like nobody gives a cares about me why should I care about them so I understand what it means to have that sense of belonging like having elders to support you community to support you that big difference that it makes in providing that direction in your life and that stability um, Culture does save lives, you know. It, it, for me, it's it's a huge uh, part of my life. The sweat lodge ceremonies, the canoe journeys, uh, the smudging, um, yeah, just having that sense of belonging, that grounding, and that supportive community. I think culture is so important in terms of healing and reintegration efforts for the men and the women that are coming out from the prison system. Um, a lot of them didn't have exposure or chance to practice culture growing up, but I think when they come out to the community, I think it's very important for their healing. Um, it allows them to uh, process trauma um, from their past. I think a lot of them come out from the prisons feeling like they have a broken spirit. I feel like practicing ceremony and engaging in culture allows them to heal that spirit. I think when, especially when brothers go back and find their heritage and realize that we come from a very, very proud people and they should be proud of who they are and where they come from. And when our history is, is, is full and full of life and you know, we're only shown us a bit of our history because that's how they want us to portray us. But I think you know, there's so much more and I feel like when these guys go back and they go rediscover their heritage, they find a piece of them that I think that has been lost and that's been lost in the assimilation of the indigenous people. So for them to go back and try to find that and find that little bit of happiness, I think is amazing. And I think it could do wonders for a person. The hardest thing for me through my whole sentence was the loss of my mother. My mom died. January 3rd last year. Um, she was a huge supporter. And I just, I know she's proud of me. I know she's looking down on me. I feel her all the time. So I know she's there with me. I know she supports me. And it, it pains me to think about her because her pain is my pain. And if I can use that and try to help other people, then I think she'd be proud of that. 
and that's what I'm going to do. The first project that I was involved with is uh, the carving of the traditional seagoing canoe. And uh, we carved that canoe in, in 2000, and uh, we hired eight urban Aboriginal youth to carve a, a, that canoe. And, um, and we also uh, had a lot of input from the Squamish elders, like Bob Baker, Wes Nahaney, and they, they've helped us um, work on the, uh, on the protocols, following the protocols, the traditions of the West Coast. Um, that canoe's journeyed up and down all the way up to the tip of uh, Vancouver Island, all the way down to Victoria. And uh, it's traveled thousands and thousands of miles. It's uh, literally helped uh, a lot of the, the brothers and sisters, uh, you know, like as they're pulling together, they're, they're working on themselves. We've also gone on pulling together canoe journeys, which is about the um, 17 uh, police departments. So we've had uh, brothers come down with them on the, on the healing journeys. And uh, at the beginning of the journeys, the police and, and the brothers inside are really standoffish with, the, with each other. But by the end of the journey, um, you start looking at the at beyond the uniform. And I know as well that the, I've seen the police as well when they've journeyed, journeyed down the river, they've, uh, they don't see, um, uh, we would have healing circles at the end. And I was seeing like these big burly police officers, you know, crying and saying that they were sorry of what they'd done, what they had did in terms of the history, but also what they had done personally to indigenous people. And just the, the healing that they experienced as well, it was incredible to see. So the canoe, builds bridges, you know, and, it, and it's been a, an amazing part of Circle of Eagles Lodge's history. I was originally one of the canoe participants on the first journey back in 2000, and that first journey was from Vancouver to Port Hardy, and then from Port Hardy to Victoria. It was 1,800 kilometers, three weeks. It was absolutely grueling. <laughs> um, but I found myself on that canoe journey too, because before the journey, I was like struggling and I was drinking and I was doing a lot of binge drinking like young people do. And I didn't know my place and I couldn't find my place in the world. I felt like I was on the outside looking in. And then once I participated on that first canoe journey, I found myself and I found my purpose. It allowed me to create relationships with people that I would never normally associate with or talk to unless it was like in a professional capacity. But to actually see police officers as like regular human beings that cry and they have feelings too. And I still feel strongly for pulling together and I believe like the good work that it does. Yeah, police officers, a lot of them don't know much about Indigenous culture. They no, have had no exposure to it. Being in the canoe and uh, there's a lot of um, our host nations uh, putting on display their culture, their dances, their songs, sharing their uh, big houses with us. Uh, opening, I think it opens the officers' eyes to the richness of our culture and uh, but it also, it just humanizes us all, like the youth, the police, it's not, it's, we're seeing each other as people, not that troubled youth on the street or that person that's enforcing the law. We're just human beings that are working together for those 10 days. In 2003, we, we decided that we wanted to do a, uh, um, a five-day healing retreat specifically just for the brothers. And so we started calling it traditional workshops. And since then, it's now called Zetsosum Canoe Healing Journey. But we wanted to take the guys out from the uh, institution, but also from the ones that were in the community. And so we wanted to have an opportunity for them to be to experience the, the journey. So we were able to partner with uh, Squamish and also the Boys and Girls Club, Camp Potlatch. And we would come in and be here for five days. It was an organic experience where it just, you know, developed by itself. The prayers, the, the sweat lodge, the, the um, let it go ceremonies. Then there's the mental, the um, working on, uh, you know, like anger management, um, the emotional, uh, the physical. Physical would be on the water. So morning you'd wake up, go in the spirit bath, uh, 
a workshop and then a canoe and then, and then in the afternoon would be the uh, sweat lodge. I look at Camp Potlatch as coming to the wilderness, coming out to Mother Nature and use that time and, and kind of do some soul searching and, and collect your thoughts, regroup, think about where your life's headed and at the same time experience the culture, whether it's going into the sweat lodge or talking to elders or other brothers and sisters that have been through the same things that I've been through. Basically share those stories and welcome each other with open arms and be honest. True healing begins when you put that as a thought. It just simply begins with, I want to have that be part of who I am. So true healing doesn't have to have a set time. It doesn't have to have a set place. It, ha it comes from within. It comes from when you really want to have change. Nobody can tell you it's time. Nobody can say, you know, now's the time to do this. No elder has that power. That power comes from when we ourselves say that it's time. The future's bright, man. Like I, I, like I do things now, man. I, I, in the last year, I've accomplished more in the last year than I've accomplished in, 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 in my entire, like, you know, like whatever, anything that I was doing. Like I got my license. I had a job for a whole year, a full-time job. I've been out for one consecutive year. So these are all the things, man, that I was able to do because of, um, you know, the environment that I was in, which is Circle of Eagles. As those are my dreams, just to be free and just to work with, uh, work with the youth. You know, I still work with guys that are getting out of, you know, getting out of jail. I'll help them out, you know, and I'll give them, give them the shirt off of my back. And, you know, that's the, that's the stuff that I was taught. Within the Vancouver Police Department, it's it's uh, there has been a change in their perspectives. Like even 17, 18 years ago, I didn't know what residential schools were. Uh, uh, so educating myself on that uh, through the the uh, uh, process of teaching them about the, the reality of residential schools, the Indian Act. You now, hopefully, I'm building them that understanding of why things are the way they are and hopefully that, that education will lead to comp compassion when they're dealing with our, our people and I, and I do see that. I do see them having that understanding of you know, cause and effect. Circle of Eagles is now looking forward to, and this was originally Marge's vision, part of it is to expand of where we're at. So. Right now we have the men's facility, the brother's facility, and the sister's facility for the women. The goal is to have second stage housing for a different population. So there will be an aging house for the brothers that are not able to be on their own because they're either multiple health issues. The average age now of, of men in that are leaving the institutions is over 50. So we're looking at what kind of accommodations can we do as far as that goes. So having a second stage housing that they would be able to move into is one of the ideas. And then just look at more housing options, whether it be different housing, putting them together, but having those opportunities where we're able to help them transition and be able to find the funding to have second stage housing until they're able to move forward from there. A lot of the times the brothers were coming out with uh, lack of employment um, skills. So we started to develop like a pre-employment program. It would be a life skills component, but they would also walk away with several tickets like WMIS, first aid, to safety, construction work. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of tickets that they walked away with and that increased a lot of the brothers' employability. A lot of the brothers are coming out with incredible art, they have incredible skills in their arts. So for years we've been trying to, to have a safe place for them, or a place that is fair so that they can sell their arts and crafts. Uh, 
I think, you know, we look at everybody as a human being, as an Aboriginal person. Years ago, I didn't do that. I put myself in a different category and I hated people of different nationalities and different culture. Through my culture, I've learned to accept everybody as a human being. And coming from that place, I always like to say that no matter what it is that you're facing, eventually, you'll get to a place where you're going to be okay with yourself as long as you continue to believe in yourself. And there's always going to be people that are going to be there to help you and to guide you. The most important thing that you can do for yourself is to never give up hope. Taking your own life is one of the things that you can never, never, ever change. And you can't take it back. That is not an option. You know, no matter what I've experienced in my own personal life, I've seen that too many times. And I tell you, don't even contemplate anything like that, because there isn't anything in this world that you cannot overcome. Things are changing. It's slow, but it is happening. Our, our graduation rates are growing, are going up. Uh, our voices are being heard. You know, we're, we're taking back our culture. Uh, it's very much a cultural renaissance. It's taking that pride. I remember growing up as a child being ashamed of who I was, of, that, of my culture, of the fact that my father, uh, who wasn't in my life a lot, I remember one instance as a child, he showed up at the ice rink and all the kids said, oh, we didn't know you were an Indian. And I remember being so ashamed that that man was my father. Now I, I get, it makes me angry that I was made to feel that way as a child, but now I carry my culture on my sleeve. Literally, I have tattoos. I, 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 my sons have drums and, and come and help out at the sweat lodge. So they're learning to be proud of their culture, where I really grew up in an in, in era of shame. But it's, that's changing, and we're all you know, taking back our strength and our culture. Each of us has a lens that we look through. For Circle of Eagles, we look through a lens that's support and hope and caring. And we look at each and every brother or sister that walks through that door as an individual that has huge potential to move forward. Corrections Canada looks at it through the lens of public safety, but they also want to see this successful, but we each have different lens. And we started out with this lens that was so far apart that we were looking through a whole different picture. That, that lens is coming together, I believe, and, and I see moving forward that we're going to start moving to the place where we're all looking together and seeing that what we want is to have each individual move forward. And in order to do that, we need to continue with Circle of Eagles to push where we think the culture and the, the hope keeps saving lives and keeps moving forward and keeps people out of the institutions to have a healthy life in the community with a future that they can be proud of. Without the circle of vehicles, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have found me. I wouldn't have found the old boy that's, I would be still a kid in me. Because this place is a, a healing, healing place. I get emotional when I start working there. Doesn't matter how hard it is when it bent over. As old as I am, about I push myself. I still got that little kid in me. My energy is there, my mind, but my body is weak. So I let these kids do what they do. Learn from the teacher right there. That's how you pass down the wisdom. When they grow old and uh, learn enough, they too will pick up that tool and start their own sweat like this or whatever else is taught here. So that's why I'm so thankful for Circle of Eagles for bringing us here in Port Lodge Camp, the beautiful environment.
if more communities can step up and help support the brothers. You know, again, a lot of, the, a lot of times we're dealing with stigma and discrimination. It's not only through mainstream that, that we face it. Sometimes it's from our own communities. We need to really open up our hearts and engage and, you know, make a difference. I want to leave a better legacy for my grandson. I want him to grow up in, in a better system than I grew up, better than what my parents grew up. That's my hope, my legacy. Places I never dreamed of. You showed me a path that was right. I had a dream. I had a dream. I've been unworthy I've made mistakes in the past I can't admit I was in a hurry Things don't always come when you ask There have been times when I'd stop and wonder When will my life begin? Gave me 